After playing catch-up in the CPU space for years, AMD finally overtook Intel last year with the release of the Ryzen 5000 series of processors, providing better performance in almost every workload, all the while consuming less power than their Intel counterparts. But today, Intel fights back. In the 11th Gen Core series of desktop processors, codenamed Rocket Lake, is Intel's first attempt at clawing back the CPU performance crown. Do you think they did it? I'm Jia Cheng, and here at Dream Core Tech, we have tested the 11900KF, the 11700KF, and in this video, I will tell you exactly how they perform and if AMD's reign at the top is over already. But before that, let's take a look at new platform features. With the introduction of Rocket Lake, Intel has finally brought PCIe Gen 4 to their consumer platforms, almost two years after AMD did with Ryzen 3000. However, the PCIe and M.2 slots that are fed by the chipset are still only Gen 3. In this regard, the new flagship Z590 chipset is only on par with AMD's mid-range B550 chipset. Where Intel has an edge over AMD, however, is in connectivity. The AMD X570 platform is coming up on two years old already, so most bots are lacking the latest connectivity features. Meanwhile, all Z590 bots come standard with Intel 2.5 gigabit LAN and Wi-Fi 6E where there's Wi-Fi. The 11th gen CPUs also come with native support for Thunderbolt 4. Implementation, however, is up to the manufacturer. We've already seen MSI Z590 Unify with two Thunderbolt 4 ports on the back, which is really nice. While Z590 is great, we see even bigger improvements to Intel's mid- and low-end chipsets. B560, H570, and H510 all support PCIe Gen 4 the same as Z590. This brings PCIe Gen 4 support down to even the cheapest H510 bots, whereas AMD's competing A520 platform is limited to just Gen 3. Another exciting feature is the unlocking of memory overclocking on B560 and H570 bots. This is particularly great for gamers, as the capping of memory speeds on previous mid-range Intel platforms have always hindered the gaming performance of their CPUs. We're expecting the faster memory speeds to truly unleash the new 11400F and replace the Ryzen 5 3600 as the gaming value king. Moving on with more good news, the new 11th gen processors are compatible with last gen's Z490 bots. On some Z490 motherboards, manufacturers actually included PCIe Gen 4 support. MSI, for example, made the announcement a few weeks ago that all of their Z490 bots fully support 11 Gen's PCIe Gen 4 capabilities, which we have independently confirmed on our Z490 Tomahawk. Like on the new 500 series bots, the top M.2 slot is connected directly to the CPU via PCIe Gen 4 when used with a 11 Gen CPU. So that's the 500 series platform, where Intel is winning some, losing some. So what about the CPUs themselves? The 11th gen Rocket Lake lineup consists of 14 total SKUs. Like with 10th gen, the i5 has 6 cores while the i7 has 8. The i9 tops the lineup with 8 cores. Wait, just 8 cores? Didn't the 10900K come with 10? Why is the 11900K only 8? Well, here's why. The 11th gen series of CPUs is based on the Cypress Cove core architecture, the first big update to Intel's core architecture since the release of Skylake in 2015. The Cove family of core architectures were originally designed for Intel's upcoming and much denser 10 nanometer manufacturing process. But because of delays to said 10 nanometer process, Intel converted Cypress Cove to the existing 14 nanometer process. On 14 nanometer, the new Cove cores are so large that they could only physically fit 8 on the CPU package. The die is about 30% bigger, and you can even see that the heat spreader is ever so slightly larger. Despite the reduction in the max core count, Cypress Cove promises to bring up to 19% improvement to instructions per clock. So, do these claims hold any weight? Let's go to the benchmarks. We are testing the 11900KF and 11700KF against the 10900KF and 10700KF, as well as the Ryzen counterparts the 5800X, 5900X and 5950X. For RAM, we are using 32GB in dual rank at 3200MHz CL16 with tight primary timings. You might have heard of the new gear setting for the 11 Gen CPUs, and for these benchmarks, we are only running in Gear 2 as we were unable to get Gear 1 running at a decent speed. Gamers Nexus has already done Gear 1 versus Gear 2 testing and found the difference to be just a teeny tiny bit. Cooling the CPUs is an Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 AIO and the gaming test will run with a Sapphire Nitro Plus Radeon RX 6900 XT. Alright, here we go. Starting in Cinebench Multi-Threaded, we get an idea of what's to come. The 11700KF is 16% ahead of the 10700KF while the 11900KF is 4% ahead of that. Here, the 5800X and 11900KF are functionally equal. We also see that the 11900KF 
is 6% behind the 10900K. In the single-threaded tests, the IPC gains come to light. The 11-gen CPUs improve on 10th-gen score by about 20%, scoring 621 for the 11900KF and 597 for the 11700KF, which put them just a little bit behind the 5000 series. For RAM access latency, the previous-gen Intel CPUs has a 10 to 15 nanosecond advantage over Ryzen 5000. However, here we see the bigger Cypress Cove cores of the 11th gen increase memory access latency by about 7 to 10 nanoseconds. To kick off our productivity benchmarks, the 7-zip benchmark shows a 7% improvement in compression and 13% improvement in decompression for the 11700KF. Meanwhile, the 11900KF is 8 and 9% behind the 10900K in compression and decompression respectively. In 7-zip at least, the IPC improvement just can't make up for the reduction of two cores. On the flip side of the coin, we see a rare win for the 11900KF in Y-Cruncher. Y-Cruncher is a math compute benchmark and here we are using the 5 billion digits of Pi preset. Here, the 11900KF took 240 seconds in computation time, an impressive 9% reduction compared to the 10900K. The 11700KF took just over a second more at 241 seconds, providing a 17% reduction compared to the 10700KF. This generational jump puts the two new 8-core Intel CPUs just seconds behind Ryzen's competing 8-core 5800X. In the Blender BMW and Classroom rendering benchmarks, the 11700KF reduces render times by 14 and 18% respectively when compared to the 10700KF. Like we saw in 7-zip, the 11900KF just can't stand up to the 10900K with the reduction of two cores, showing a 13 and 8% increase in render times. In another rendering application, V-Ray shows a 20% improvement for the 11700KF, achieving a 11,127 score. Contrary to the Blender rendering benchmarks, we do not see a performance regression for the 11900KF, with the 11900KF scoring within 1% of the 10900K. To conclude, the 11700KF performs pretty well in productivity benchmarks, providing a 7-20% to improvement compared to the 10700K, which puts it within 5% of the 5800X in everything but 7-zip. The 11900KF, on the other hand, is a significant regression in productivity performance compared to the 10900KF, with the only gain in our tests being the compute-focused Y-Cruncher. This puts the 11900KF just ahead of the 11700KF and roughly on par with the 5800X, while being more expensive. So, not great. But what about in gaming? Starting with the 3 d Mark Time Spy synthetic gaming test, we see both 11 Gen CPUs above the 5800X, but as we shall see in a moment, this does not translate to real-world gaming gains. Horizon Zero Dawn is a DX12 game built on Guerrilla Games' own Decima engine, which is actually also used in Hideo Kojima's Death Stranding. At 1080p in the original medium preset, the 10900K and 5950X lead the pack at 215fps average. The two 11th gen CPUs, as well as the 5800X and 5900X, are not far behind at 209 and 210 fps the 10700KF is at the bottom of the chart with 205 FPS, but it is still just 5% behind the leaders. Next up is Rockstar Games' Red Dead Redemption 2. Built on Rockstar's own Rage engine, RDR2 has quirks that can sometimes expose unexpected performance differences in tested hardware, just like the older GTA V did. At 1080p, with the graphics set at the middle balanced preset and in the default Vulkan setting, the 10900K once again leads the pack with an average 132 FPS with the 10700KF and the two 11 gen CPUs 2 FPS behind. The Ryzen CPUs hit a wall 4% behind the 10900K at 127FPS. Moving on to a newer game, we have CDPR Cyberpunk 2077. The latest 1.2 patch came out after we had already done all the testing, so this is with version 1.12. We test at 1080p medium settings with a section of the vehicle shootout just after the start of the game, probably one of the most intensive parts of the game. In this game, the two i9s lead the pack at 152 FPS, and just like in RDR2, the Ryzen CPUs top out lower than Intel, with the 5900X averaging 149 FPS. Functionally though, all of these CPUs tested were identical in real-world performance. Testing a more eSports-focused game, we have Rainbow Six Siege also in Vulkan mode. At 1080p, the Ryzen 9 5950X tops the chart with a blistering 513 FPS. Surprisingly, the 11900KF and 11700KF both sit at the bottom of the stack, roughly on par with the 10700KF and 10% behind the 10900K. To round out the gaming benchmarks, we have the Civ 6 AI turn time benchmark, 
which pits 12 AIs against each other and times how long the moves take to compute. In this sense, it is a lot more akin to a compute benchmark like Y-Cruncher in a productivity test suite, but is nevertheless relevant for gamers of similar turn time based games. And just like in Y-Cruncher, we see 11 Gen's biggest gains here. The 11900KF and 11700KF provide an amazing 12 and 14% reduction in turn time compared to their predecessors. This puts them just behind AMD's 8-core 5800X even though the 5900X and 5950X do provide a further 5 or 7% decrease in turn time. Now you might have noticed that all of the above games were tested at 1080p. Even though yes, I hear you, many buyers of these CPUs are looking to game at 1440p or even 4K. We test at 1080p such that we can isolate the performance of just the CPU as much as possible to show the full potential of the performance. We do this by testing at 1080p and using the best GPU for 1080p, the 6900XT. But you're not wrong. The performance differences at higher resolutions are not as large as at 1080p. To illustrate this, we tested two games in all three resolutions with ultra quality textures to cover all the bases. Representing the latest AAA games, we have Horizon Zero Dawn. In all of our tested resolutions and settings, the difference between the best performing CPU and worst performing CPU was limited to 7% or less. In real terms, this is just at most a 10 FPS difference at a 200 FPS average. Representing higher FPS esports games, in Rainbow Six Siege, the 15% difference between the best and worst CPUs at 1080p is reduced to just 5% at 1440p. At 4K, the difference reduced to a meager 3%. Like many of you probably suspected, performance differences between high-end CPUs at 1440p and 4K are not worth worrying about you will see much more of an impact spending more money on a GPU instead. Now that you have seen how the CPUs perform, let's talk about power consumption. While Ryzen's boost algorithm is opportunistic and gives the CPU exactly the frequency and power it needs, Intel's boost technique is comparatively rudimentary. With the 11th gen family, Intel has introduced yet another boost feature called Adaptive Boost Technology. In short, this new feature allows the 11900K and KF to use more power and boost to a higher frequency when many cores are loaded. With that, Intel's boost system is now even more confusing than it already was. So if you would like a full rundown, check out Anantech's explanation in their article. For power limits, the official Intel spec calls for a long-term power limit of 125 watts, with the 56 second boost period being allowed 250 watts for the 11900K and 229 watts for the 11700K. These values are unchanged from 10 gen. And just like on 10th gen, it is worth noting that most motherboards stretch these limits to some degree by default. On the MSI boards we tested on, the BIOS asks the user to select the capability of the CPU cooler on the first boot. When the stock cooler option is selected, the Intel spec is enforced. Selecting tower cooler increases both the long-term and short-term power limits to 288 watts. The water cooler option basically eliminates power limits, letting Turbo Boost 2.0 to fully determine clock speeds. So if you see your 10th or 11th gen CPU overheating, it might be worth looking into reducing the long-term power limit such that the CPU stays within a safe temperature in an extended workload. If you have an adequate cooler however, setting higher limits will allow you to get the most performance out of your CPU. For our testing, all of the comparison benchmarks shown earlier were done in the unlimited power mode so that we can see the full potential of the Intel CPUs. However, we do have some benchmarks here to quickly show how the power limits can affect performance. With power limits unlimited, the 11700KF draws 220 watts to sustain 4.6 GHz on all calls. With the tower cooler 280 watts limit, we see the same numbers, since of course 220 watts is below the 280 watt limit. With the official spec in force, the 11700KF draws 220 watts for the same 4.6 GHz for a maximum of 56 seconds dropping to 125 watts and 4 GHz for the remaining duration. As a result, we see a substantial decrease in the Cinebench core. But we also see CPU temperatures drop from 75 degrees Celsius to just 55 degrees Celsius. Testing the 11900KF, we see adaptive boost technology feed an insane 340 watts of power to the CPU, sustaining an incredible 5.1 GHz all-core frequency in Cinebench, increasing the Cinebench score by 10% to 6401. But as you might have guessed, the temperatures are uncontrollable, with the CPU quickly hitting 100 degrees Celsius and throttling after a minute or so. This is despite us using one of the best coolers on the market. Therefore, we see ABT as basically unusable and downright pointless even. 
If you have cooling that can handle this much power, you will get 5.1 GHz all core with a manual overclock using less power. Looking at more reasonable numbers, we see ABT off and power limits unlimited. The 11900KF sustains 4.8 GHz all core with 240 watts. With the official spec enforced, the 11900KF drops from 240 watts to just 125 watts after the first 56 seconds and uses that to sustain 4.1 GHz all core for the remaining duration. Just like on the 11700KF, we see a substantial decrease in Cinebench core, but also a 20 degree drop in CPU temperature to 60 degrees Celsius. To compare against other CPUs, we ran Prime95 small FFTs and looked at power consumption both as reported in software and measured at the wall. For the 11900KF, the onboard telemetry reports 280 watts, with our power meter at the wall plug measuring about 400 watts for the whole system. The 11700KF reports 300 watts, while measuring 410 watts at the wall. In a stark contrast, the 5800X draws just 135 watts. Remember, the 5800X provides the same or better performance in almost all our benchmarks. In this test, the 5900X and 5950X sustain lower all-core frequencies and thus draw even less power, despite the higher core counts. If you as a buyer would like to reduce the power consumption on the Intel CPUs, enforcing the official long-term power limit of 125 watts is something we recommend you do if you do not have adequate cooling or if you are concerned about electricity use. So, where does that leave the 11 Gen CPUs? In gaming, the 11th gen makes essentially no gains to 10th gen's gaming performance and basically still trades blows with the 5800X. In productivity performance, the 11700KF is about 5% behind the 5800X but it also comes in at a significantly lower price. Where the 11700KF really shines is in the compute-heavy workloads like Y-Cruncher, V-Ray or even Civ 6 AI Term Time benchmark where the 11700KF showed a 20% improvement over the 10700KF. Overall, we call the 11700KF a decent budget alternative to the Ryzen 7 5800X. Anyone who's looking for 8 core performance but thinks the 5800X is too expensive will love the 11700KF. Where the 11th gen really falls short is with the 11900K and KF. Because of the reduction in core count, rendering and other productivity workloads take a roughly 10% hit in performance compared to the 10900K. We see equivalence and a small gain only in compute heavy benchmarks like Y-Cruncher, V-Ray, and Civ 6 turn times. This makes the 10900K and also the 10850K still great options for users that need the best multi-threaded performance on the Intel desktop platform, especially since they have been heavily discounted at many retailers in the past few months. If you're looking to buy one of these CPUs, here's what else we recommend you buy. Motherboard-wise, if you can get a Z490 board like this Z490 Tomahawk from MSI at a discount, they provide full PCIe Gen 4 support and offer core and memory overclocking. Another good value option is the new B560 series of motherboards, which offer memory overclocking, allowing you to extract the most performance out of your 11 gen CPU with a kit of, say, 3600 MHz XMP memory. Many B560 boards, like this B560 Tomahawk Wi Fi from MSI, have also added high end features like a robust VRM, 2.5 GB LAN, and Wi Fi 6E. By the way, big thanks to MSI for sending this over. Taking a look at the board, we have a Tomahawk that lives up to the name its predecessors made. Featuring grey heatsinks with no RGB, the board has large VRM heatsinks and heatsinks over two of the three M.2 slots. We also get two X16 PCI slots, as well as a X1 slot at the bottom. For front USB, we have one USB 3 header, two USB 2 headers, and one USB-C 10 gigabit header. On the rear I.O., we get four more USB 3 ports, as well as USB Type-C 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 which is 20 gigabits, and four more USB 2 ports. We also get a HDMI, and DisplayPort for the CPUs with integrated GPUs. Networking on this board features Realtek 2.5 Gigabit LAN and AX210 from Intel Wi-Fi 6E. On their B560M, Morta, Bazooka and Pro VDH motherboards, MSI has also added PCIe switches so that the top M.2 slot can be used with a 10th gen CPU. This makes sure that if you use their B560M boards with a 10th gen CPU, you still get two functional M.2 slots rather than just one. Take a look at MSI's blog for more information. To keep the CPU cool, a basic 90mm or 120mm tower cooler will be able to keep temperatures controlled at Intel's official 125W long-term power limit. If you're looking to increase the long-term power limit to 250W or higher, we recommend at least a big dual tower cooler or a 240mm AIO water cooler. So that's all from us here at Dreamcore Tech today. Thanks for watching and let us know what you think of the 11 gen processors in the comments.